Mike Wilner. We got him now from the Deep Left Field podcast. As you probably saw, Mike, before we get to the Jays, uh, Netflix announcing yesterday this documentary is coming out on the Expos leaving in 2004. What do you remember about that time and the Expos' entire tenure in Montreal? Well, about that time specifically, I remember going to a couple of games in Montreal. I can't remember if it was a Jays series. I know earlier I covered it for 680, but I left there in 2001. Um, so it must have been for the radio. I remember Esteban Loaiza pitching and throwing his teammates under the bus after the game, which was horrible. But m most of all, I remember that there were about 3,000 people in the stadium, and they sounded like 30. Like, they were loud. They, everyone would grab the chair beside them and start pounding it uh, because it was empty. Um, they made noise. They got excited. And, and uh, I remember thinking, wow, there are 3,000 people here in this stadium, and they are louder than 15, 18,000 people at the Dome, which is what the crowds that we used to get at home were like. So um, that's, that's the biggest impact that Montreal made on me in its in its late stages for sure the biggest montreal memory i have though obviously would be uh in 2019 2018 uh in spring training when vladimir guerrero jr hit that walk-off home run with two out in the ninth to break up the nothing nothing game and, and it was just so magical and such an incredible moment and uh, i did that game with Elliot Price on the radio, who had called so many Expos games over the years, and he was in tears when it was done. Um, it was, it was just that was that's my most incredible memory of of the the Big O, and the Expos weren't even there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm eager to watch this documentary. Are you? Yeah, it, it, absolutely. I'm all for any any Expo stuff. I you know I love those teams in the '70s. Um, I told the story, I can't remember to who, a couple of days ago, or I think it was on, uh, on my podcast, uh, on Deep Left Field, uh, last week when we had a mailbag and somebody asked about my favorite Expo memory. And, and I, I remember that the day I was in grade five, the day I got my braces off, I was 11 years old, was Black Monday. And I remember uh, leaving the orthodontist and not wanting to, to leave because the game was on, but I got on a bus to go home and the driver of a TTC bus had the Expos game on, uh, on the bus. So I sat up there and listened with him and I heard that Rick Monday home run and it was, it was just heartbreaking. And, you know, 1994 was just heartbreaking. There was so much heartbreaking about the Montreal Expos, but that you can only have your heart broken if you're in love, right? So um, they, they were a really yeah. lovable and exciting team. Let me see those things. Give me a smile, Mike. What, what do you want to <laughs> see? Money well spent. Those teeth are straight. They did a great oh, job. Yeah, back. we got the braces off. Yeah, yeah. they look good. Yeah, my okay, parents, and hey. My parents, money well spent. You didn't come on here expecting probably to talk about all this, but I'll, I'll just ask you this lastly before we turn the page to the Blue Jays. Do you see Major League Baseball returning to Montreal in a permanent full-time capacity? I'd love to. I really would love for that to happen. I don't know. I hope so. I'll say that. I hope so. Uh, I believe that, you know, once the Oakland situation gets sorted out, uh, and who knows what the hell is going to happen there yet. I'm not buying for a second still that they're moving permanently to Las Vegas. Vegas doesn't want them. Um, they don't even know where they're going to play next year. Um, so I, I don't know what's going to happen there. I think ultimately a deal winds up being made and the team is sold and they, they stay in Oakland. Um, but once they settle that situation, once they settle Tampa Bay, then they will look to expand. Will they expand to Montreal? I mean. I, I hope so. I, I really do. I think that there might be a, they might be a little more interested in going west, maybe to Vegas if Oakland falls through or to Portland, and maybe to going um, you know somewhere in either Tennessee or, or North Carolina. But I, I really, really do hope that Montreal's in there. 
to uh, to the Blue Jays, our audience is not that optimistic. We had a poll yesterday. Where do you expect them to finish? And the majority voted fourth or fifth in the American League East. Is that is that apathy reach the people you're talking to, or is that just our viewers? I don't know if it's apathy. I think you know, Fangraph says the Blue Jays are going to finish fourth in the AL East. Um, it's it's difficult to look at this off season and say that they've. Uh, done what they wanted to do, that they've improved in, in uh, any sort of significant way. But um, very, very rarely does a team with excellent pitching and defense miss the playoffs, one, and not make a decent run, two. The Blue Jays were an anomaly last year when they won 89 games, made the playoffs in the last spot, and went out so quickly in the first round despite leading the league in pitching and defense. Um, and I don't think that's going to happen again. The question for me is, can they keep the pitching healthy? Uh, if they can, they're going to be very, very good. They really are. They're, they're um, as frustrating and as disappointing and as awful as last year was. We forget that they won 89 games. That's one fewer game than the team that won the World Series. Texas won 90. The Blue Jays didn't win a game in the playoffs, but neither did Baltimore and neither did Tampa Bay. Um, I really believe in the, the internal improvements. I mean, I saw Vladimir Guerrero Jr. this week. He looks incredible. Alec Manoa looks like he's dropped 50 pounds and he's in incredible shape and he looks like himself. Uh, and he's got his old demeanor about him, which is wonderful. I'm expecting a better season from Dalton Varsho. I think that Justin Turner really, really, really does help this team. I think they were intentional in bringing a guy like Turner over to sort of teach these guys um, how to meet the moment. You know, what stands out incredibly for me about Justin Turner is that he's got a career OPS of eight. I might get this backwards, but I think it's a career regular season OPS of 829. And in the playoffs, it's 8.30. He is exactly the same guy in the playoffs as he is in the regular season, which speaks volumes. The approach doesn't change. The moment does not ever get too big for him. And that's something that a lot of these Blue Jays uh, could stand to learn, not just in the playoffs, but, you know, how many times last year did we see everybody coming up to the plate in all these 2-1, 3-2, one nothing games, thinking they've got to be the one to be the hero. Um, Turner's approach, if he can teach them that, would, uh, would help uh, tons, I think. I think this is going to be a really good team this year. But at the same time, I don't think there's any way for them to generate any buzz until they start going out and winning. By the way, ba way back at the start of this, the term apathy was the wrong term for me. Um, pessimism, maybe, but no, they do care. They just don't expect them to do too well. So just to clarify on that, you're yeah, right. I, it was not the, the proper last thing term. Want is apathy. Yeah. Yeah. When the fans are apathy, you're, you're done. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Hinjin Roo, what's his legacy in Toronto in your mind? I mean, he's the guy who who flipped the switch on the on the team, right? They lost nineteen game, ninety five games in twenty nineteen, um, and we weren't sure what sort of level of rebuild the Blue Jays were looking at. Um, you know, we we were confident because Bo Bichette and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Kevin Biggio all made their major league debuts in 2019 that this wasn't going to be an astros or cubs type rebuild where they were going to be awful for a decade but um but ryu advanced things forward he signed he was he was the most coveted left-handed starter on the free agent market the blue jays got him they got him because they were willing to add a fourth year uh and they got him by giving him the largest free agent contract they had ever given to any player in the history of the franchise. And that showed that they were willing to play with the big boys. And they had n not showed that before. Really, really ever, they had not showed that they were willing to play with the big boys 
Um, you know, in, in 2015 and 16, most of the acquisitions were by trades. They did give Russ Martin the big contract, but they traded for Josh Donaldson. They traded for David Price. They traded for Marco Estrada. Um, so, and they developed a lot of their own guys. Bautista and Carnacion, they developed even though they had draft them or sign them originally so this was the first time they showed that they were willing to really spend like they mean it and i think that opened the door for george springer the most coveted free agent on the market to sign here the next year it opened the door for them to get kevin gosman and give him 110 million dollars it opened the door for them to lock up jose barrios to that seven-year deal after they traded for him um and it, it really did show teams that they meant business and Kinjin Ryu was here for four years and they made the playoffs three times in those four years the last time the Jays made the playoffs three times in four years was 91 92 and 93 um, so I really do think he had a very very significant impact don't forget he was a Cy Young finalist his first year I think he finished second in 2020 um, so I, I think his impact was was huge Mike, lastly, can you please tell our audience where they can find deep left field and what you got going on here as we open spring training? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can find deep left field wherever you get podcasts, whether you listen on uh, uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or you can go to thestar.com and, and find it there. Um, it's, it's everywhere. Podcasts are, are wonderfully um, distributed, so... Just search Deep Left Field in, in your podcast uh, platform, podcatcher. And I just spent six days uh, in Dunedin, uh, six, six days grinding it out at camp. I came out with 16 interviews that will be played at various points on the podcast over the course of spring training. But today's episode that comes out in an hour or two is, is pretty significant. Uh, Bo Bichette and John Schneider are on the show, and Bo speaks really powerfully about the things that went wrong last year, about his expectations for this year, about what he needs to do, and how he's going to um, take a step forward as a leader. The changes, you know, we, we talk about Vladdy needing to get into shape and Manoa needing to get into shape, and Alejandro Kirk needing to get into shape. Nobody talked about Bo Bichette needing to get into shape, and Bo transformed his body as well over the offseason because he wasn't thrilled about the way his season went getting hurt in August and September. Uh, you'll hear a lot of really, really good, deep, powerful stuff from Bo. And then a 36-minute conversation with the manager, John Schneider, a great one-on-one -on -one about last year, about the year before, about this year, about him his ties to the organization that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. There's nobody uh, with the Blue Jays, nobody who's been in that organization as long as he has. John Schneider was drafted by the Jays in, in 2022. Pete Walker beat him by like six weeks when the Jays picked him up in May of that year, but Walker has left and gone back uh, and come back. But Schneider has incredible ties to this team. He bleeds blue and... Um, and really all, all he's been, I think all the fans see him as a sort of a target for their frustrations. So uh, you'll hear two amazing conversations on Deep Left Field this week, and you'll hear plenty more over the course of the spring. Sounds great. Mike, I always, always enjoy our chats. Thanks for this, brother, and uh, have a, a great time following the Blue Jays. I can't wait till we chat again. Thanks, Rod. And if I could, just what, for one second, give a little plug to this little studio I'm in here. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to Jordan Romano and Eric Swanson about their spring training uh, obsession with baseball cards. And they told me about this store in, in uh, north of Toronto called Mint Inc. And uh, I popped in here to sort of follow up on the story and talk to the owners and then it got to this time and he said hey come back in our studio and do it so uh this is a really cool place and uh, you can see all the 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 studio and the cards and uh the amazing things here um so this is what we got here at, at, at mint inc in toronto and thank them for letting me use this studio looks grand good stuff thank you mike thanks rod Jay's analyst, broadcaster, podcaster, Mike Wilner.